This is the world's smallest and probably most impractical STM32 breakout board, which you might have seen in my last video. And today, I want to show you how you can get started designing your own custom STM32 hardware because there are quite a few benefits to being able to choose a specific microcontroller suited to your project, like lower power consumption, smaller chip packages, and reduced cost, among others. I'll be showing you how you can select the right chip for your application, how to implement it on a PCB using KiCad 8, and how to use STM32 Cube IDE to configure hardware and generate code for your custom designs. So make sure you download the software you'll need for this tutorial in the description if you haven't already. And before we get started, I'd just like to give a big thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring my channel with high quality manufactured and assembled circuit boards. Make sure to stick around to the end to learn how you can order your designs from them in just a couple clicks from KiCad 8. All right, let's get started, or should I say, let's get started. As you might already know, the STM32 product lineup is insanely massive, so it might be confusing at first looking at 22 different series with different processor cores, different clock speeds, different core mark scores, and different process nodes. So let's clear that up a bit first, starting with the ultra low power line. The STM32U5 is targeted towards advanced HMI, home appliances, consumer electronics, and battery-powered devices. Since it has huge amounts of flash and RAM, a vector graphics Neochrom GPU option, many advanced low power modes, and great power efficiency, consuming less than 25 milliwatts in benchmarks while delivering pretty decent scores. Some notable interfaces of this series include USB high speed with integrated PHY on select variants, MIPI DSI, USB CPD, a camera interface, and trust zone security. The L4 Plus series is more or less similar in application, but has less memory, doesn't have a USB PD interface, and is also priced a bit lower, with lower power efficiency and an older processor core, the Cortex M4, which consumes closer to 70 milliwatts in benchmarks while delivering scores about 38% lower than that of the U5. Moving on, the STM32 L5 series also runs a Cortex M33 with Trust Zone, but it's clocked at a lower speed, has less interfaces and memory, and consumes up to 63 milliwatts in benchmarks while delivering 8% higher scores than the L4 Plus. It's a good choice for applications needing a crystal-less USB 2.0 device, USB PD, various audio interfaces, a CAN bus, or capacitive touch sensing. So I'd guess that USB keyboards, microphones, and speakers are the main products that would be using this chip. The L4, not to be confused with the L4 Plus, is the L5's lower CPU performance, higher power efficiency Cortex M4 counterpart, which consumes only 33 milliwatts in benchmarks and delivers scores about 33% lower than the L5, with similar interfaces and a wider product range with more memory options available up to 1 megabyte of flash instead of just 512 kilobytes. The top of the line L4, the L496, also has a Chrome Art graphics accelerator, so I could see this chip also being used for something like a stream deck among many other applications. The U0, L0, and C0 series are all targeted to super simple cost-effective devices, which would also work well on battery power, like smoke alarms, gas meters, and door locks, and can sometimes be used to replace 8-bit microcontrollers because they are just so cheap and have the benefit of still being integrated into the STM32 development environment. You get a standard set of interfaces, USART, SPI, I2C, Segment LCD interface, and even crystalless USB 2 on the U0 series, but don't expect great power efficiency or performance from one of these little guys. Onto the high performance line, things start to get a lot more confusing. For the F2, F4, and F7 series, the H stands for high performance and high power efficiency, if you get what I'm saying. And the only product I've seen the F7 in is as the USB to serial converter in ST-Link programmers, since it has integrated PHY for USB high speed, and neither of those shortcomings really matter in this case. Kind of like how Arduino uses an Atmega 16U2 as the USB to serial converter in the Arduino Uno. Despite all of this though, the STM32F4 is a decent choice for digital signal processing and is commonly used in 3D printers because of it, like the Ender 3 S1 Pro. 
The poor power efficiency of the F-Series by today's standards can mainly be attributed to an almost ancient 90 nanometer process node from 2003, which causes more leakage current and various other losses that increase power consumption in all modes by orders of magnitude compared to the more common 40 nanometer process used in the vast majority of 32-bit microcontrollers nowadays, like the STM32H5. A good balance between pretty solid performance exceeding that of both cores of an ESP32 to break a thousand core mark and low power consumption of just 58 or 106 milliwatts during that benchmark depending on whether a switching or a linear regulator is used to deliver the core voltage, which we'll talk about later. Anyways, with the H5 you also get some cool interfaces like i3C, USB CPD, Ethernet and camera interface, and a bunch of low cost variants. For example, the chip variant used on Nano X is only 250 USD each, when an Atmega328 with 500 times worse performance is closer to $3 each. Moving on to the top right corner here, we have Mr. Phil's lab's favorite microcontroller series, the STM32H7, as well as the STM32N6 series, both of which approach the performance of mid-range Linux microprocessors at or around the 3000 core mark range, while consuming less power and being better for real-time operations thanks to not needing to run a dedicated operating system and having some of the less complex peripherals integrated on chip. Along with those less complex peripherals like a fast ADC and PWM, the STM32H7 and STM32N6 integrate more advanced ones too, like MIPI CSI2, a whole neural processing unit for AI, 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 USB high speed with integrated PHY, a super fast Neochrom GPU, an H.264 encoder, a JPEG hardware accelerator, an image signal processor, and the sort of memory interfaces you would expect out of, as I was saying, a mid-range SBC. Of course, these features vary between different subgroups within these series, but you can expect to see the newest ones in the H7RS subgroup and N6 series, in which only select variants of the N6 integrate an NPU, which hits an impressive 0.6 tops. Of course, there are also some of the most expensive microcontrollers you can buy, ranging from about 750 each to 20 bucks and more, with the peripherals, performance, memory size, and number of GPIOs generally corresponding to the price in some way or another. Moving on, I probably wouldn't use any of the STM32 wireless chips at this stage except for the WL, since it has sub-gigahertz connectivity which could be useful if you want LoRa on chip. For Wi-Fi or Bluetooth though, I would honestly just use an ESP32 since the development environment, libraries available, and pricing are superior and I'm going to be waiting for the release of the ST67W, a collaboration between ST and Qualcomm, before I start adding 2.4GHz wireless connectivity to my STM32 projects. For mixed signal applications like a BLDC motor driver, STM32G4 is the preferred choice with its many advanced timers, with a variant integrating MOSFET gate drivers for BLDC drive also available under the part number STS pin G4. Similar variants of the F0 and G0 are also available, and overall, commercial ESCs will use these chips offered by ST to save a lot of space as opposed to using a microcontroller and separate gate driver ICs. Also, forgot to mention, the STM32U3 Ultra Low Power MCU was released only just a few days ago after I had already edited most of this video, and it runs the same core as the U5, the Cortex M33, at 96 MHz instead, with even better power efficiency and the addition of two i3C interfaces which is pretty cool since no other STM32s outside of the high performance line integrate the new bus. Once you've selected a chip series and go to overview, there will be different product lines with different peripherals but more or less the same processor core which you'll have to choose from. And within those different sub-series, you'll need to select a chip package which also might not have all the peripherals that your sub-series claims, as that will only be available on the largest chips. For example, the STM32H523 subseries claims to have support for full speed USB and USB CPD, but USB CPD wasn't available in the 39 pin wafer level package I chose for Nano X. In the same way, the smallest member of the H5 line, which comes in an even smaller 25 pin wafer level package, doesn't have support for an external HSE because those pin functions aren't available on any of the GPIOs. Anyways, now that you have your part number and you've verified that it has the functions you need using this table in the chip datasheet, it's time to go into STM32 Cube IDE and practice assigning functions to the GPIOs before you proceed with your project to ensure there's enough of them accessible to have a debug interface 
an external crystal which I would recommend but isn't necessarily required in all cases, and the peripherals to interface with other parts of your circuit such as I2C, PWM output, UART ADC input, and USB. Once you click save, it'll ask you to generate code, but click no for now as we'll be testing only basic functions at first. You'll be able to find even more ways to configure your hardware for specific applications online. Now, let's get started with the schematic. The first thing you want to do is search up getting started with STM32 hardware development for the series you chose and scroll down to the appropriate reference design where you'll find the bare bones schematic. And after you look at that, you might as well check out the rest of the document to quench any concerns or questions that you might have. And it's generally 2.1 but could also be somewhere in 3 or later that tells you the function of each power supply pin. You also want to head back to the chip datasheet once more and search current characteristics to find out how much current your voltage regulator needs to supply to VDD. And unlike an ESP32 which experiences huge current spikes during transmission, you can probably just use this top value of the table plus 150 milliamps or so just to ensure the regulator doesn't heat up to an uncomfortable amount and also to power any other 3.3 volt peripherals you might be running on the same supply voltage. You should probably read most of the remaining parts of the datasheet, but other than that, let's move on to actually making the schematic. So yeah, in general, to get an STM32 up and running, you'll need some input filtering and a voltage regulator, a whole bunch of capacitors to ensure stability of the logic lines, maybe an inductor if you're using an SMPS variant, an external HSC with appropriate load capacitors calculated from the crystal's load capacitance using this formula, maybe some more filtering between the analog and digital power lines, and your debug port, which is generally just the two SWD lines and power since a chip reset can still be done through software and the boot pin is only used for DFU that is uploading through USB, UART, or some other serial interface without as many debugging options, which might make more sense in the case of mass production. I also like to add an onboard LED to test GPIO output, which is a good sign of your microcontroller actually working, but this is completely optional. Before we move on to the PCB design, I recommend filling in all the fields of each symbol along with two additional ones, MPN, manufacturer part number, and package, so that the export to manufacturing process is more streamlined later on. And all of this data comes from a website like DigiKey, Mouser, Arrow, or Element 14 where you can easily find electronic components and make sure they're in stock. Onto the PCB design, after you've set up your clearances, trace widths, and other necessary manufacturing constraints, I'd recommend just placing those decoupling capacitors and the crystal fairly close to the chip, if not as close as you can, to ensure stability of those logic lines. But other than that, it's fairly standard practice here. I normally use a ground plane on all layers to help reduce EMI, keep predictable trace impedances, reduce crosstalk, and aid with heat dissipation, as well as these stitching vias between the planes. But I know some people like to use one of the inner layers for a power plane. Personally, I prefer to route power with thick traces instead or smaller planes which don't occupy the entire layer. Of course, you can also use any other amount of layers even though I show 4 here, and you don't always need ground planes if you aren't dealing with high speed and or impedance matched signals, but those are just my personal preferences and come on, boards with ground planes just look better in general. Once you're done, ordering your board is super easy, and all you have to do is download the PCBWay fabrication toolkit from the plugin and content manager in the bottom of this initial list that pops up when you open KiCad, go into your PCB file, refresh your external plugins, click the PCBWay to file icon button, and check out the newly created manufacturing files which are in the same folder as your KiCad project. Now open up the BOM file, save it as an XLSX, Expand the columns so you can see them better, delete DNP items, and delete the value DNP and footprint columns since you don't need them. What you should be left with is columns for designator, quantity, package, MPN, and mounting type, which will be used by PCBWay to source parts and assemble them onto your PCBs. Verify with inspect showboard statistics that the quantity column adds up to the correct amount, keeping in mind the DMP items that you deleted previously, and then fix up the positions file by converting it to an XLSX, expanding the columns, deleting the DNP items, and deleting other irrelevant columns until you're left with columns POSX, POSY, rotation, side, designator, MPN, pack, and map type. As for your Gerber file, it's already taken care of by PCBWay's program, and all you have to do is go into your Gerber folder, select the files, and zip them. Now, to get our PCBs manufactured, we're going to head over to PCBWay at PCBWay.com, and you can get $5 off your first order if you sign up using the link in my description. Watch, it's super easy. Go into PCB Instant Quote, click on Quick Order PCB, add your Gerber file, choose your PCB specifications and quantity, and then scroll down to Assembly Service and add your assembly quantity. 
I generally leave the other options as they are, but if you have a board which requires components on the bottom side only or on both sides, make sure you include that in the details too. Don't mind the other parameters section or the customized services and advanced options section unless you explicitly need one of these additional processes done, and then you can add to cart, go to your cart, and upload your bill of materials and component positioning file, which is also called the centroid file and you're done. You're also gonna to want to order a programmer and debugger for your board if you plan to use the SWD or JTAG interfaces. And you can get an official ST-Link V2 or ST-Link V3 like I have here from about $10 from various electronic component distributors. A clone ST-Link off AliExpress which has the same functionality as the official V2 in a smaller package for two bucks, affiliate link in description, or a Segger J-Link for hundreds of dollars which supports a much more vast array of microcontrollers outside of SDM32 if you have quite the budget to afford one. Alright, now that all of our stuff is here, we first want to flash our ST-Link programmer using the software package which can easily be done by connecting to the device, clicking yes if it asks you to upgrade to a new firmware, and then disconnecting it before anything else. You can now either power your custom STM32 board with a benchtop power supply before plugging it into your laptop to test for shorts or mistakes in your PCB design, which will be indicated by an excessive amount of current being drawn, or you can just plug it straight into your laptop and hope for the best, which I wouldn't recommend. After plugging in your programmer with your custom PCB connected, you can go into STM32 Cube Programmer and hit the connect button in the top right corner to ensure the STM32 device on your PCB is actually recognized. It should look something like this. If it doesn't, some variants of the ST-Link clones have the markings on the case mixed up, so just pull off the case and go off the silkscreen markings instead. To be honest, I was going to show you guys how to flash your first program to your completed STM32 board, but there are dozens of tutorials to do that online, and the ST-Link flashing stuff and connection stuff that I just uh, showed you guys should cover most of the problems that you have in terms of like troubleshooting. So uh, I've linked those tutorials in the description, and have a good day. As you might have heard from my previous video, we had to move an hour and a half away so that I could be closer to my university. And my degree's been going pretty well so far, but on the other hand, my workshop isn't fully done setting up yet. As you can see, we have an absolutely crooked <laughs> shelf over here. Uh, the wood doesn't even fit because um, it's like so crooked. I mean, look at that. Um, we also still have some equipment to buy and the lighting sucks here. So if you'd like to help further support my development and see better content faster, especially for like the, you know, thousands of dollars of stuff that we're getting to buy for the next videos, make sure to support me through YouTube Super Thanks memberships or the Ko-Fi page that I recently just opened up. Even if you don't support me financially though, I really just appreciate that you're here watching this video. So thanks so much to everyone here and I'll see you in the next one.